Hey, Nicole, how you doing? Hi, I'm doing well. How's it going? I'm good. I'm good. You know, thanks for thanks for joining us. I know you have a crazy busy schedule and uh, I really appreciate your time. Of course. No problem. I'm happy to be here. Well, wonderful. You know, as um, as everyone's logging in, I'll just do a brief intro for the few people who may not know you. Um, Nicole Lynn is truly one of the uh, upcoming superstars when it comes to sports and sports agency. Um, you know, she's going to be very humble about it, but I'm not. So I'm going to tell you a little bit about her. Um, she's an NFL agent, uh, NBA agent and attorney for Young Money, a PAA sports agency. Uh, many have called her a force of nature, which I think is truly accurate. <laughs> <laughs> Um, in 2015, she became the first female agent to represent uh, the top NFL agency, uh, Players Rep. Uh, in 2017, Players Rep got acquired by Young Money uh, Sports Agency, which is owned by Little Wayne, as many people know. Uh, in 2019, she became the first uh, black female agent to represent a top three NFL draft pick by the Jets, uh, Quinn and Williams. Uh, today, she is one of the youngest female sports agents in the industry, signing her first agent at only 26. Uh, her list of clients uh, is very impressive. Uh, they're on the Broncos, the Raiders, and the Washington Redskins. She was awarded two-time Woman of the Year by The Hustle. And actually, uh, just this week, just this week, she was named one of the 50 most influential and powerful women in sports on the same list as Serena Williams. Has she answered yet or not? <laughs> She has not responded. <laughs> Shockingly. Yeah, I mean, I, I'm sure it didn't go through. I'm sure the, I'm sure it's a Wi Fi. It was my Wi Fi. Has to be. Um, anyway, uh, very, very happy to have um, Nicole Lynn on here. Uh, this is only the beginning for her. And I, I really, it's a very important topic talking about uh, gender inequalities in sports. Uh, and Nicole is obviously on, on the forefront of that. So, again, thank you for joining us, Nicole. Of course. Happy to be here. Uh, I'm going to start just by, uh, I want you to talk a little bit about your childhood and your upbringing. I've read a lot about that and I've seen some of your videos. Mm -hmm. Just briefly, I know that I know that your upbringing had a lot to do with your current career and the path that you're on. Can you tell us a little bit about that? Uh, sure. I'm originally from Tulsa, Oklahoma. Um, you may be familiar with Tulsa. Some of the, the things that stick out, it's the Bible Belt. Um, we're also on First 48. Uh, we are known also for the 1921 race massacre. So there are some things that we are not necessarily proud of, um, but I love the city of Tulsa and I definitely grew up on, hmm, how do I, how do I say this without getting too deep? I grew up in an unfortunate situation. I don't want to go into too many details, but you know, there's a lot of people that have stories like mine where they don't have the parental support that they need. They don't have the resources growing up, um, but I found a way out. Education was my way out. I went to Booker T. Washington High School, which is a magnet school in Tulsa. Um, best school in the, the state, I will say. Go Hornets. Uh, while I was in Tulsa, I met a lot of, you know, guys like me that ended up playing football at college, at uh, different colleges, and kind of had the same circumstances that I had. Grew up very poor, then got out because of education. And so when I met these football players that grew up in the same neighborhood, as me, I would see them go to the NFL and make a bunch of money and then somehow go broke and end up back in the same hood. So I wanted to find a way to help black men retain their wealth, right? The guys that I grew up with, the guys that look like me, that came from the exact same circumstances and environment, how can I help them retain their wealth? And, and that's how kind of the longer story short, I got into sports and, that, and that's kind of the reason. Got you. And then, and then I was reading a little bit about once you decided to be, um, be, be in um, sports agents, there's obviously a lot of obstacles, you know, um, especially being a woman in, in a male dominated field. Tell us a little bit about how you overcame those obstacles. Yeah, I mean, there's a number of obstacles. I would say even being a sports agent generally, whether you're a woman or a male, it's very difficult. It's a very competitive industry to get into. I mean, you'll see that there are very few agents that have a large clientele. You know, there may be, I think, 850 certified agents, many of which don't have any clients. They're just certified. So it's a difficult industry to get into. When you think about just women in the industry, um, I think there's only 1% of women that have an active player on an NFL roster. So that's about 30 of us or so. Um, maybe only six or seven that have multiple clients. So it's definitely an uphill battle. But the great thing about it is that there are more women getting into the business every day on all sides. So whether that be on the team side, uh, financial advisors, publicists, 
you're seeing just generally the NFL shaken up. And so it's becoming more natural when a woman walks in the room in these really big meetings. So yeah, there's a, definitely a lot of hurdles um, for women and then especially being a minority woman that adds a different layer. But, you know, we're, we're kicking down doors. We're getting it done. Yeah. And you've been frequently quoted as saying, all winners lose. And I think that's a very key statement. I think it's a wonderful statement, um, especially for people who are trying to overcome obstacles, do yep. what you're doing. Tell us a little bit about what that statement means to you, where it came from, and what other women and men should be looking at. You know, the best piece of advice I ever got from a friend throughout this process was that I needed to get comfortable with losing. And that was the first, kind of my first year as an agent, recruiting a player. I was not successful in recruiting that player, really getting turned down from um, really any big meeting that I requested. It was just tough. It's, a, it's an emotional strain. It messes with your confidence, especially when you're first starting out. And a really good friend of mine told me, if you're going to be an agent or you're going to be successful in anything, you have to get comfortable with losing because you're going to lose. And I remember hearing that and being like, okay, I'm gonna be cool with losing. I'm gonna, I'm gonna do it. Little did I know I was gonna lose like a hundred times, <laughs> you know? So you think that you're comfortable until you fall down like 99 times. But the minute I decided that no matter how many times I lost, I was gonna still keep fighting until I had that win. I think my career absolutely changed. So I give that advice to anybody, whether you're an entrepreneur or an agent or in med school, you're gonna have moments where you fall down and I know that sounds cliche, right? Get back on the horse. It's, it's beyond that. It's not just getting back on the horse. It's knowing in advance that you will fall off the horse. Okay, that's the difference. It's changing my mindset the minute I walk in and saying, I'm, I will lose at some point in this career. It is inevitable. And so I think that's what's really helped me in being successful in what I do. Yeah, I mean, it's a wonderful, wonderful, uh, you know, statement. Um, you are obviously a huge role model for women in this country. How important is it to you to inspire the next generation of women? Uh, it's extremely important. You know, I always say, if you're not walking in your purpose, you're just working and living to die. And I mean that for women or for anyone that's listening. One of my biggest goals is to encourage people to walk in their purpose and to chase their dreams. Because literally, I mean, think about it. You go to work every day for what, right? If you don't love what you do, if you're not feeling like you're you're working in your passion, you're working to die. I mean, it is as morbid as that. So I encourage every single person to be inspired to chase their dreams, right? Like I didn't have a silver spoon. I didn't have a connection to sports. There was nothing, but I was like, I'm gonna find a way. I'm gonna get in it. I don't care how many times I fall down. So I, I don't mean this lightly, but if I can do it, they, anyone could do it. Anyone. Wow. I mean, I gotta say, I mean, I'm a pretty motivated person and I'm, it's just inspirational listening to you talk. So um, truly amazing. I mean, who were your role models growing up and who are your role models now? I'm going to be honest. I didn't have a lot of role models growing up, right? I get that question all the time. And I spent time thinking, who am I going to say when I get that question? But the truth is I didn't have many role models. And I think part of that was based on the circumstances um, of my childhood. Right? I didn't see a lot of doctors or lawyers. I never knew a lawyer. You know, I never knew anyone that went to law school. I never knew anyone that owned a business. So I didn't have that. Um, you know, I really found a lot of my faith in, in God, right? I'm a Christian. And so many, uh, much of which, you know, my, my drive and my grit come from my faith. So there's not a human, if I'm being honest, there's not a human out there that has necessarily been a role model. I definitely look up to people and respect them. Um, but honestly, there, I, I don't have one. That's amazing. It's amazing like, because you clearly have a lot of inner strength. Um, and so wherever you're getting it from, obviously, obviously very, very great. Um, transitioning towards uh, gender in sports. Mm -hmm. We've obviously made a lot of progress when it comes to women in sports, but there obviously is a lot of work to be done, I'm sure, as you know. Right. Starting out, do you believe that there is systemic sexism in sports? You know, that's a tough question. But when you say in sports, when we're, we're talking about two different things, right? We're talking about the business side or we're talking about women in sports like the WNBA or pro softball league or hockey. You know, I definitely think that there is an issue there. Um, and it's, it's tough to define it, right? It's tough to define it, but there's absolutely always uh, welcoming arms for women, 
right? I think that that is changing, but there's still definitely some hurdles. So I'm just ringing that. I think I cut my live, my live off. Uh, the That's definition right. is difficult, but I think we're saying the same thing, yes. And, and people think that a lot of a lot of the issues come from a lot of the prejudices and the stereotypes of what women should be doing. I've definitely heard even even recently people say that women don't belong broadcasting sports, don't belong in sports. Obviously, that needs to go. Uh, how much of what we're seeing are just stereotypes, prejudices that are just going to take time to, to, to weed out? Oh, yeah, it's definitely just stereotypes. I mean, even being a sports agent, I still have situations where I have to prove that I know the game, right? Because there's a stereotype that women don't know football. But I deal with it myself in that when I walk in a room, I'm not automatically credible because the stereotype is still there. So I sometimes have to prove, oh, yeah, I know the game or I know the CBA or I understand this. You know, it's, it's getting to a point where it's less, but stereotypes absolutely play a role for women. Mm -hmm. And do you feel like it's getting easier for you as your reputation is growing, as people understand that you are not just legit, but you're a leader in this field? Are people questioning you less and less? Yeah, absolutely. And I think that's in any situation, any profession, right? I'm sure, you, and I don't know anything about medicine, but you're a surgeon, from my understanding, a brain surgeon. And so I think the more surgeries that you do, the more credible you become, the more your name is out there. Um, it's similar for me. You know, the more players that I represent, uh, the, the more deals that I have done, that reputation continues to grow in a good way. So it's absolutely helped. I definitely don't find um, the same situation where I'm walking into a room and, and the player's dad is asking me if I know a 4-3 defense or 3-4. That used to be like a thing. So I've gotten past that, so I feel good. <laughs> <laughs> you know, moving towards player salaries. Uh, in general, female athletes are paid a fraction of what male athletes are paid. And I think the most notable example is the U.S. soccer team, right? The women's soccer team, multiple World Cup championships, arguably the best soccer team in the world. Men's soccer team, not so much, but they're paid five or six times as much. What are your thoughts on that discrepancy? It's frustrating. It's absolutely frustrating. So I actually represent pro softball players. And I, the reason why I got into the business of pro softball is because I believe that they have the biggest discrepancy. And I, I feel for, so, for soccer and I feel for the WNBA. But if you see the numbers from baseball to softball, you wouldn't believe it. And so when I began to represent softball players, I did it for free. I, I still don't charge. When I do an, a softball contract, I do it completely for free. Because my thought is, you know, if I'm an expert in what I do as a high level NFL agent, these softball players deserve that same caliber of work, right? That same caliber of agent. And unfortunately, they can't always afford it because they're not paid like MLB. So it's a huge issue. And obviously the, the, so the women's soccer team, that's a great example. But there are, are so many women's sports mm -hmm. that don't come close to the pay of, of the men comparables. And people have looked at what are the roots of this. And one of, the, one of the major culprits people believe is the lack of marketing and the lack of sponsorships. So I saw a very shocking number saying that women's pro sports receive 0.4% of all corporate sponsorships. Mm -hmm. How do we change that? So you change that by diversifying the boards in these corporations, right? It's all about having diversity at the top. So when you have women that are at the top of these high level corporations that have partnerships with the MLB and softball and soccer, when you have a woman or a minority in the room, they're able to advocate for the women and minorities in other situations. So the more diverse that we see these Fortune 500 companies coming, becoming in their leadership, the more diverse we're going to see in where they're spending their dollars. Yeah, that's, I mean, that's obviously going to take time and I think we're moving in the right direction, but feels like we're not moving fast enough. Um, right. and, and not just pro sports, but also if you look at like NCAA, the same situation exists. Mm -hmm. So just looking at the numbers, women make up 40% of all college athletes, which, which is a good number, but they only receive 4% of media coverage, 24% of any operating budget, 16% of recruiting budget, and only one third of the scholarship budgets. How do we change that? Is that at an executive level for the colleges? Is that, is that the board of trustees? Gosh, 
I'm going to be honest with you. I don't know the solution. I don't know the solution for the college level. It's difficult because, I mean, God, I could spend a whole live on players getting paid and the breakdown of the NCAA and the payment. I think there's just a bigger overarching issue for athletes generally. And when that is fixed, it will help all athletes, men and women alike. But as far as dollars spent, it's, it's so specific to the college um, and the conference. So it's, it, that's a hard answer. I do think if there were some type of outside consultants, you know, you've got these top level consulting agencies like McKinsey and Deloitte and Ernst and Young, those kind of high caliber consultants need to be used in college sports, right? We need yeah. people on the outside looking in that can provide um, some type of insight and help to help in fixing these problems. Yeah, I mean, I think you're going to drive colleges towards putting more money into women's sports if there's more money in return. I so, agree. Obviously, the marketing, the sponsorship, which we talked about before, also kind of extends into the into the um, NCAA. Um, you know, along those lines, do you feel like, and this goes for men and women, do you feel that college athletes should be paid? Very controversial question. I just wanted to kind of get your opinion on that. Some people say yes, some people say no. What's your thought on that? A hundred percent. They should absolutely be paid. I stand, I will die on that heel. They should absolutely be paid for their likeness, for their use of their face and their name. I mean, they are bringing in millions or billions of dollars into the NCAA. And so there has got to be a solution where these young men are being paid. And I know the controversy for people on the outside, they'll say, oh, well, they get, they get full scholarships to go to college. That's enough. Well, if you really know the ins and outs of being an athlete, a lot of times you get the scholarship, but you don't get to choose your major because there are certain labs and classes that are later in the day and you've got practice. So yes, you're a student athlete and student's supposed to be first, but most of the time you're an athlete first, not by the choice of the athlete, but the choice by the school. So yes, 100% they should be paid and it needs to happen expeditiously. expeditiously. Yeah, I mean, I think it's gonna, it, it, I mean, what's the current state of that? It sounds like it's moving in that direction, right? Yeah. There are a few states in the next two years that have passed laws for payment on likeness so that a player, like when it comes to marketing or being featured in a video game, that they can be paid. The hard part about that is agents, attorneys, et cetera, representing these players. There are rules against agents representing college players or giving them a benefit. So if an agent can't represent a player in these marketing deals, but you've got an 18 or 19 year old getting these deals who have no representation, then they're going up against a big corporation it's a conflict, they're not prepared, right? Mm -hmm. So you, they still need to be able to get paid, but they need someone to be able to represent them. So I think there's a lot of things that still need to be worked out besides just deciding that they get paid. Yeah, so along those lines, but now becoming pro, you mentioned it earlier, you hear so many stories about people making fortunes and then blowing their money because they have bad advice, bad circle of friends, family doesn't help them. Um, how do we change that? How do we, I mean, should there be universal financial advisors for people coming out making millions of dollars? I mean, what do you think is your best solution for that? I think the best solution would be for the leagues and the players associations to find ways to save the money on behalf of the players. So for example, when a player is signing a hundred million dollar deal, negotiating in the deal, whether it's the agent and the player are making that decision or whether it's enforced by the league, that a certain percentage is locked up until they're 40, until they're 50. So I'm not saying all their money, but if you're signing a hundred million dollars, you don't need it right now anyway. So finding ways that the league can hold the money and it still can be invested, right? We don't want it to be dead money where it's just sitting there, but some type of um, financial product that it can sit in until, until it's needed. I mean, do you think that we're moving in that direction? Like, is there enough traction with the agents, with the players, you know, stories, people going broke. Is there enough traction to move in that direction? I don't think so, actually. I don't know that. I mean, the big movement right now is financial literacy, right? That's step one. Teaching these athletes what it means to have generational wealth, how to retain your wealth. I mean, that's always number one because knowledge is power. So I do see a bigger shift there from every league agents alike. Now, that second kind of recommendation that I made about leagues stepping in, I don't know that that's anywhere in the near future. But financial literacy, I am seeing a, a shift towards that. Um, I definitely challenge agents. And one of the reasons why I got in the business is to help 
young men and women learn these kind of financial savvy terms and, and how to actually protect their wealth. So other agents kind of being invested in that same way is going to be very helpful and very much needed. So tell us a little bit about your relationships with your players, because clearly you, you, you form these bonds, right? And it's, it's much more than just the money, much more than just the sports. You have these players that are coming out, let's say they have nothing and they sign some huge contract. What do you do as their agent, as their friend? How do you mentor them to make sure they don't blow their fortune? Uh, so I have a program that I created called Fishers of Men. It's based off the biblical principle. You give a, a man a fish, he'll eat for a day. You teach him the fish, he'll eat for a life. Um, my players call it rookie school. So every single player that I sign has to go through this rookie school. And we cover high level, but very important adulting topics. So that's anything from the basics, how to tip at a restaurant, to how does a bank account work? How to write a check? What is an LLC? What is a 501c3? You know, and the reason that I do this is many of my guys have played football since they were five, right? So they have a PhD in football, but they've never had an internship. They've never had a job. They've never got a check stub. And so although they may have a financial advisor that manages their portfolio and their stocks and bonds, it the, it's these small little things that we do on the day to day that we take for granted that they don't know how to do, right? Writing a check. Right? I make all of my guys learn how to write checks drafting a professional email, learning how to blind copy or copy someone on the email, uh, learning how to draft a resume, like learning how to change a tire, right? These all sound stupid to us on this call, but they are instrumental in our lives and very important. And so it's part of the program that I created. I'm very, very, very passionate about it, as you can tell. Um, and I'm hoping to be able to grow it out for guys that I don't even rep. Yeah, I mean, I was just gonna say, it sounds like that is, like that should be mandatory. Um, how many other agents really should, I mean, how, how many other agents that you know and that you work with do something similar and how many just literally don't care and don't do any type of educational program for the players? I don't know any agents that do anything similar, but I won't say that they don't care. I have a lot of uh, peer agents in the business that I'm very close with that I love. And I think that genuinely care about their guys. I think everybody has their own approach in protecting their players, right? I'm more of a teacher. That's part of um, one of my skill sets. So I love to teach and, and mentor and coach in that way. But there are other agents, I think, that just have different approaches. But I don't know of anyone that has, like, a class, right? And, and my guys laugh about it. I'm like, oh, we have rookie school. And they're like, oh, my God, rookie school. But, but they end up loving it, right? Like, once they have the info, they always appreciate it in the end. Oh, for sure. I mean, it's I'm, honestly, that's that's kind of game changing, you know, pardon the pun. But but really, that's something that I feel like all the players, NFL, NBA, Major League Baseball, whatever, they really should have that because you just hear too many stories of people that are that are just uneducated and don't are, are not sophisticated enough when it comes to finances. Uh, moving back towards women in sports, because I really want to get back to that and talking about the importance of women in sports um, and, and how do we get more women into sports, even in high school? Because I was reading some stuff about how important sports are for overall development of women. They said that 94% of women who are in leadership positions have played sports in high school. That is amazing. Wow. And then they did a study looking at, at women who played sports in high school. Um, they do less drugs, better grades, get into better colleges, and overall better health. So clearly, you know, we need to push this. How do we increase women's involvement in sports? Is, is that a grassroots effort? I mean, it's really having the opportunity, right? There are certain schools, I mean, I'm sure people even watching this, their high school where they didn't have a women's soccer team or they didn't have a women's volleyball team. So I think the first step is having the option to even sign up for these sports by expanding them in schools. You know, the way that you can do that, similar to like a Title IX in college, is make sure that there is a one-for-one. -one. So if there's a football team, you need to have whatever can be comparable for women. Maybe it's a rugby team. I played rugby in college. And so, you know, whatever that may be, but it, it keeps athletic directors and head coaches accountable to ensure that there are equal opportunities for both men and women. What would you say um, is, what has been the number one factor in your success? Overcoming all the odds, which you already talked about, uh, being a female, being a minority, going into sports agency, which is a male dominated field. What is your number one attribute for success? Oh man, that's tough. 
I'm going to say with the exception of God, because I'm always going to come back to God. So I'm going to say besides, we'll take that out because we know that's number one. But um, I'd say my number one attribute is, let me think about this. I don't, I want to give a good answer. Sure. Um, I mean, my work ethic is, my work ethic and my willingness to sacrifice, I think that there are not many people that are willing to do that. So I've got very close friends that are always like, oh my God, she's always working. And, you know, she, you know, I'm missing certain things on the weekends and, and all these big personal um, achievements that people have, um, vacations, whatever. I'm not doing all of that. I'm, I'm always putting my time into my work. So it's a strength and a weakness. Right, because on the weakness side, it's of course. you have, to have balance, and that's one of my biggest weaknesses. I'm terrible with self care, work life balance, terrible. But on the strength side, I'm willing to sacrifice. Right, I'm willing to make the sacrifices for my dreams. I'm willing to put everything on the line. I worked for six years. I've worked two full time jobs: full time attorney at an international law firm practicing civil litigation, and full time agent. Those are totally separate, totally separate companies. They do not overlap at all but I'm willing to do it so that I can still chase my dreams. That just means I'm working all of the time. So sacrifice would probably be number one. I mean, absolutely amazing. I know we have to wrap it up here because you have another meeting, but where do you see the future of women's sports? Do you, do you think that it will, at some point in the near future, have some type of equality with male sports? The near future? <laughs> the future, absolutely. Um, you know, obviously I would hope it's in the near future, but I'm in this business every day and I'm a realist. So I don't know that it turns around tomorrow, but I think we are on the right track. One of the best ways for us to get there is for the male athletes to advocate on behalf of the women, right? And I tell athletes when I meet with them, right? When I had my first, first round draft pick, I told the player, this is your career. You get to choose if there are women sports agents, right? The NFL doesn't pick if we have 50 percent women sports agents or not the players pick right so if we only have one percent of women sports agents that's on the players you have so much power in your hands as an athlete and so it's the same and we see like lebron james always pushing the WNBA. if we had all athletes with that same mentality pushing women's sports there would be no choice there would be no choice it is in the athlete's hands they have so much power and so i always encourage every single athlete to remember their power and their leverage. Um, so is it in the near future? I don't know that it's in the near future, but we are definitely taking the correct steps and strides to get there. I love hearing that. Listen, I could honestly talk to you forever. I know you have to go. I just have to say that it's truly inspirational. And I don't say that lightly because it takes a lot for me to get inspired, but your, your, your story, your path, what you're doing, what you've already accomplished, unbelievable sky is the limit i, I really you. can't wait to see what you do next i appreciate it thank you so much i appreciate you having me on of course nicole have a great day great talking to you see ya bye-bye take care